Welcome everyone to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host, and with me for all of these upcoming episodes on Skeleton Crew is my co-host, Kyle Gould. It's me. I'm back. Nice to be here in the same room as you, Marie Claire. It has been a rare pleasure to be able to record with you. Live and in person. Live and in person. Uh, Not in our normal place. Nope, we are out in the world, and so this episode might be a little bit shorter, and if we miss anything, we'll definitely bring it back up in the next episode when we're able to record. And if you're a dedicated listener of What the Force from New Zealand, well, just know that we are in you. (laughs) I'm not you, the listener, that probably... I meant meant New Zealand, but... We're, yes, we're, we're in New Zealand. I yes. guess we are in your ears while we are in New Zealand. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, let's dig into Skeleton Crew, which, you know, there's been a lot of information out there on the internet about kind of the inspirations uh, behind this show. And I've been really, really excited to dig into it because it looked exactly you know, my sort of thing that I would enjoy, uh, space pirates and exploring the world of Star Wars from the lens of, oh, I don't know, 10 to 12 year olds, which is, of course, what I've always talked about as the perfect Star Wars age. This, just like uh, as a top level note from me is it made me really, really sad for all the 20 somethings out there. Like the people who are in their very late, late teens and early 20s, because kids are going to love Skeleton Crew and Mm -hmm. people in their 40s and 50s and later, they all they all love Star Wars as well. And then there's a, a group of people in their mid to late 20s, like they're into the going into their 30s that fell in love with the prequels when they were kids. Mm But this feels like really the first live action in context of Star Wars production that kids who would be in their early 20s and late teens, they they never got this. This will this isn't they will never be the superstar fans of Star Wars because this sort of thing didn't exist for them. it, It hasn't been aimed at that generation since in, the prequels. Since the prequels, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. And um, there's some really cool, interesting things happening from uh, a mythic motif perspective. There's some cool things I want to be able to talk about throughout the episode, but we could dig right in and talk through it, and then I can pull those things out as we talk through those episodes. Sure, it's going to be spoiler centric. I don't doubt. Oh so yeah, definitely. Yes, you two will have already seen these two episodes. Um, kind of three episodes from my perspective. Oh really? Well, yeah. That first double episode has definitely two arcs to it, and then the third, the the second in quotation mark episode, um, would feel like a normal third episode, but it feels cut short because. The first episode has this long uh, ramp up to it. Um, So, yeah, spoilers ahead as we dig into uh, what could be a real adventure as they go way, way out past the barrier. Yes, this could be a real adventure. Um, And the episode starts uh, with an intro into the universe explaining where we are sort of in the Star Warsian timeline. It's past the Empire. It's with the New Republic. And oh my goodness, with the New Republic sort of expanding their power into different spaces, piracy has increased in many sections of the galaxy. Yeah, I want to cycle back around to this particular topic towards the end of our discussion. Mm -hmm. um, When we're talking about larger motifs and scales of politics and change. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really want to hit off the top of it. Right now? No, I don't want to dig into this now. Let's save it. You get here, you're at the end, then you will get to hear all of my thoughts on this. <laughs> on um, piracy in general? <laughs> no, it's beyond that. Oh, okay, so, okay, okay. Good what thing. a graphic intro. Right? It was an intense... Wow. Like, there's like these... 
sort of like spear like tunneling boarding tubes tubes right and then we also got to see like some we got to see some ship to ship combat sort of where they were taking out the guns and we got to see some intense fighting on in the insides of the ship and how good slash bad the pirates seem to be they seem to be kind of average against an average crew there was just a lot of death yeah there was um, yeah there was so it was it 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 struck me the same way that uh, vader at the end of rogue one struck me really? it seemed like wanton violence and death dismemberment disfigurement and destruction it wasn't that bad for me but i it felt like yeah piracy is actually quite scary right it was just so graphic the um penetration into the ship the explosions that they did with the bombs in space the way pirates just laid down their lives by by boarding in the first place and the crew themselves also dying immediately and and violently um mm-hmm. all for nothing right right yeah Um, And they clear the way and we see several uh, key pirates. We see uh, Brutus, who's the wolf looking guy. Uh, We see Gunter, who is played by Jaleel White, Mm. um, most famously known for those of us in my generation from TGIF or Thank Goodness It's Fridays, um, Family Matters. Yes. Stephen Urkel, the neighbor. <laughs> yes. Did I do that? Uh, and we had Brutus, who, of course, was the wolf man. And then Vane, who uh, how we have seen this character before in Mandalorian Season 3. It was so interesting because that was the only one that stood out for me, especially in the next episode. Right. Um, I was like, wait, we've seen him before. And so it was nice of you to find that he had actually already been yeah. in in another show. Um, do, and it does make me wonder now what what the timeline looks like for this character. Is this before Mandalorian or is this after Mandalorian? I think it's after. after? Man- yeah, it's like in order. They're sort of releasing these. That makes sense. Um, and then they clear the way for Captain Silvo. Yes. Who has a, a cool helmet. And I instantly, you asked and I was like, yes, that's him. I'm like, that's Jude Law. His voice, even with the modulation of the helmet yep. and like the vocal work or the audio design that they're doing around his voice, it sounds like the cadence of his voice. So um, I was I was just like, oh, yeah, that's absolutely going to be Jude Law's character. And I think that we get it sort of confirmed by the end of the next episode. Uh, but we're not supposed to think that it, that's him. No, and didn't his helmet look a lot like Carrie Russell's character's helmet from yeah. Tross? Like, it just seemed so similar. It had a very similar vibe, like, yeah. Um, like, this helmet is only here to hide that I'm a famous person. I it, think is really, what, like, like, that's the that's the commonality between those two helmets. <laughs> like, yeah. they're not actually all that similar. They're similar in that they both hide famous people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... We see that they are breaking into this magnetic vault. It's supposed to be holding a lot of credits, and it has one credit in it. And we're told that. Like, Mm -hmm. twice we get told there's nothing in the vault. Well, then why is it magnetically sealed? There's nothing in the vault, and I defy you. um, I really liked that scene. Yeah. There's some power there. Exactly. And... And so this causes a mutiny with the captain and we fade off. Yep. This is our setting. So the setting opening sort of, it's almost like a prologue to the actual show. Um, is It is the beginning to the end of the second episode. Like if, yeah. we, if you don't, if we, they hadn't released both episodes at the same time, then I don't think we would have gotten the payoff. But because everybody is binging both, you get kind of a movie 
version Mm -hmm. where you're seeing this character and, oh, this is important. Ooh, the bad guy is doing something or or some other, you know, it's not connected to our main series set of protagonists as we know them. It's giving us something else. And then we get a payoff with it in the end of the second episode by saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you knew that was right. That's that guy. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So then we cut to At Atten. At Atten. At Atten. Yeah, there's no other real words for this. Like, I've done some quick Google searching and whatnot since the show came out for what Atten could be or what At Atten could be. Um, and it's not really clear. There is only one commonality, and that is attain, which mm. is like that thing that is sought for and not yet Mm. reached Mm -hmm. so it's something you're attempting to attain or gain grasp a hold of and what's something that is constantly uh being sought after in the quest to be attained is related to the fact that sometimes people argue over atat or at ads yeah i I feel (laughs) very much like that's that's kind of a secondary one but attain uh, when it comes to treasure is super relevant and important like everything i found when i was looking for uh some some reference to atten attain was connected to that and treasure is always coming up in the description So we are introduced to Wem, who is a little boy. Mm-hmm. Ten? Wim? Wim. Wim. Yeah, his dad is Wemble, and he is Wim. Wim. And he's playing with his action figures. Yes. And his dad is a typical dad. He's like, are you getting ready for school? But is, yeah, but is he? Yeah. He's busy. Yep, he's he is. He's a busy adult. <laughs> yep. That is what we are, are led to believe. He's got lots going on with work. He's a single dad. We definitely see that. Yep. Um, and there's Wim. He's having his cereal with his not blue milk. It's more like... Green milk? Uh, definitely. Like, if, like if you were going to have chocolate milk, then maybe this would be milk? like... I don't know. It seemed more on the gray-blue side. Darker blue. Yeah. Chocolate. Yeah, chocolatey version of blue milk. So, Maybe. Yeah. And he's having his cereal and his dad's like, I'm really busy this week. And he leaves him credits to have lunch. Which, when you saw that pile of credits, did it not look like a giant pile of credits in the first place? Here's some money for lunch. Oh, here's some more. Like, this is for your lunches all week? Yeah. I was like, that seems like a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> uh, they don't break a credit, I guess. Yeah, I, I also, he didn't seem to know what the values of any of those credits were. Yeah, yeah, like... The, which seemed weird later on. It, it didn't seem particularly irrelevant at the moment, but also, like, his dad's given him a big pile of money he for him to buy his school lunches. And that maybe, made sense. But maybe it's more like you expect the adult to, like, take the money and give you the change, you know, like... Yeah, I would yeah. think, as a kid. So so it made sense, but at the same point then, it also felt like a lot of money. It felt like a lot of money. And I think that's because we haven't seen money. Not very often. We no. We see, like, Beskar, and we've seen, like, Credit Pucks, and, like... And, uh, but we've seen mostly flan. it's been... Rela- flan. Yeah, like, that's true. Yeah. But mostly it's been in relation to... Imperial credits. Yeah. Which were on sticks. Like you did. Mm-hmm. I don't think they had physical Imperial credits that weren't on sticks. Like data sticks. Yeah. It's, and it's weird because like when we covered Bad Batch, we, we covered that whole rampart, like him changing the credit system and like, right? like the, the finances of that. That was so weird. I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about. I liked the look of them. Oh, yeah. They were very pretty. Yeah. And I feel like we've seen credits like that in maybe the prequels or in the prequels. In Clone Wars. Like it it felt old though, which was nice. Yeah. Especially in relation to the tiny coin that we had with the with the New Republic logo on mm-hmm. it on the back that was picked up at the very beginning. So it's already telling us money is gonna be relevant in money is gonna be relevant in this story. Yes, exactly. So, Wim, 
he finishes up and he heads on out the door and he meets up with his best friend, Neil. On the sidewalk. On the sidewalk. Just off of his lawn. Just off his lawn. And, and he pulls out his like faux lightsaber and they have a, a pretend lightsaber battle. But so, it's like, it's very like, like dual. Like, you know, you can almost hear like the, you know, woo. Yeah. music like it was so cute and this is this is like part of um something i'm gonna bring up actually in relation to not only like him reading stories about jedi and like the belief in that um this is all part of something called child lore it's interesting that you went to a jikino uh, mm. song immediately for that moment when... Well, it's not Jik, Jik, you know, it's, uh, oh my goodness. Oh, I forgot there. It's very late. Sorry. <laughs> Which? Oh, the, the music? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's done not by him. This, this music is not done by the great Western musician, the great Western composer. No, no, no. But there wasn't, there wasn't music like that at that moment. It just felt like oh, that sort of moment. There absolutely was music akin yeah. to that, but not that music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was similar in style to that music. And that's because the composer is his son. No, you're thinking of something else. I am? Yes. Oh. So, Inicio, Inicio Marcone is who I was thinking about as far as the music goes. Yeah. But Michael Giacchino is... Who did Star Trek, the great composer as well. Yes, as well as, I believe he did Rogue One. And Batman. And Batman. Yeah. And this is actually his son that has composed this. Oh, it's Mick Giacchino, Mm -hmm. who is the son of Michael Giacchino, Neither of which are connected to, to Morricone. Morricone, no. Anyways. <laughs> That's so funny. I thought Mick Giacchino was the was the son or the grandson of Ennio Morricone, which is uh, definitely not the case. <laughs> no, that is not the case, no. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was actually child lore, which is cool. Um, a subset of folklore. Folklore being, of course folk tradition, stories, sometimes even um, what is considered to be charms or or things that um, we carry forward with us and pass information person to person through uh, mostly verbal storytelling. And child lore is its own version of that that usually only exists when you are a kid. And so Wim's uh, exploration of Jedi stories... And uh, even just pr- plain pretend Jedi reenacting Jedi-like rituals is classified as child lore. But there's other things that are popping up in this show that classify as child lore. And I wanted to ask you, what is something from your childhood that you remember as uh, child lore? I remember... When I would walk on a sidewalk on the way to school or whatever, mm. uh, I wouldn't step on any cracks because of the rhyme. Uh, if you step on a crack, you'll ba- break your mother's back. Right. And if you step on a line, then you'll break your father's spine. Exactly. And yeah. that's all child lore. Mm. And so we've already gotten a little tiny bit of it with sort of games or rhymes or or uh, superstitions or agreements in how kids must behave mm. in in uh, the world itself. But yeah, Wim's like exploration of Jedi sort of folk tales or folklore mm-hmm. that his dad definitely views as childlike, classifies as child lore. Yeah, it's really interesting, um, not only the context of the child lore, which is like the the common language and way in which words are used between the kids is something that they understand, Mm -hmm. but then also his connection to these books on the Jedi that are maybe 
they are they Jedi? Are they not Jedi? And there's this fight that's happening between a red lightsaber wielding guy and a blue lightsaber wielding guy. Um, but then I also start to wonder how long At Atten has been behind the barrier mm-hmm. because you know the the Empire has fallen. Were they there the entire time before the Empire fell? Mm-hmm. How long has At Atten been? This hidden hidden world. away yeah. and locked away from the light from the stars because they yeah. don't even know what those are and yeah. so um it made me wonder since that's like 13 years that these kids are around give or take they're about that age maybe 10 10 to yeah somewhere in that, that age, yeah. like and then how how many more series of kids have there been uh it seems like this place has been around for a while and is very well established and so if that's the case they know he has no he has zero idea but to, of of Luke and mm-hmm. Darth Vader and the fight between the two of them and his battles that he's doing are mm-hmm. are what 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 is this story I mean, that he's living out in his it, mind It could be even older than that it's not something that even the Jedi themselves believed in during the Clone Wars, really. Like, right? before the Clone Wars, they were like, oh, Sith, they're like a long, long time ago. That's a fairy tale. That's a fairy tale. So this is this is like old, even uni- in-universe lore yeah. that is being passed on through child lore yeah. to this child. And I love it. It's so neat. Um so we see them have their little engagement and then I love how they stop it. And it reminded me a lot of like Calvin Ball or something like that with like Calvin and Hobbes. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. I got something in my eye. Like you have to pause the imagination game. Exactly. When you have something in your eye or like you're hurt or whatever. Or something real happens. Yeah. I love how they're caught up in their own space and time and connection with each other and disregard the fact that they're being witnessed or watched by anybody else, yeah. n- namelessly us, yeah. right? So we're watching them, but they're suddenly, you know, espied upon by the kids across the street with their quip of like, what are you two doing? Yeah, I love that so much. <laughs> so they catch the bus and they get to school and Neil's like, kind of like this very like, straight laced like he he does what's expected of him and Wim's like like don't you ever wish like you could do something else like go on an adventure and this is to me like so satisfying because it's like the first rumblings of um what is classified in uh adventure journeys like this as the dissatisfaction with the status quo Something yeah. doesn't feel right. You are getting a call from the universe that a journey is coming for you. It's like a herald. <laughs> exactly. Also, there's a real nice um, connection here between uh, how how quickly the eldest child of a big family can get derailed by an only child. Yes. <laughs> That's very true, yeah. Right? Like, the only child who has freedom and resp- from responsibility and no one looking out over him. And also the expectation that everything is for him. And then, then you have the eldest child here who is constantly being reminded of their importance and their utility to those who are under them and their responsibility for them. Then has to take responsibility for the eldest child who has all these dreams and wanderings. And you, you kind of can't help but get caught up and swept into them yeah the old only child yeah um so they're in class and things are being explained to them as far as uh, like it was it, it seemed like it should have been mathematical tables like right five times tables but it seemed way more complicated than that it was so complicated it was so very, very complicated, like base five. And he was like, and I was doing base five, but I got mixed up because between base seven and base down and base nine, who would do such a thing? He said on the bus, yeah. right? On the tram. Um, and, and there was just something off about the school as well that I noticed right away. I was like, I was excited about school. It was really interesting. Yeah. And yet school was so immediately discernibly 
technical and there was a droid speaking in this monotonous very droid like fashion mm. that w- it seemed like it was just trying to put you to sleep like the director's choice was this has to be at a cadence to knock you out so that you are not even paying attention to what's going on and you'll that much more better connect with Wim and um, Wim was drawing a very cool drawing on his like, absolutely smart board computer thing. You mean etch a sketch? Yeah, because <laughs> he was literally turning well, two toggles. And it's like the analog style of computing still exists here. Yeah, right. It's not like super duper high tech. Everything is still analog in Star Wars. Right. It, it was very interesting. And then he gets caught by not the teacher. No. Nope. But by Undersecretary Farah. Yes. Who is there to explain that there there is a test tomorrow and that they have to take it very seriously because this will uh, assign them a career path and then they will become part of At Atten's uh, contribution to the great work. What? I I fully agree. The great work. I yeah, it's part of what was making me very tense by this because yeah. everybody's job would become a data a data analyst or a supervisor or whatnot. There's, There's no room for like, hero. Analysts are con- like accountants. Like it's like all like data work. Yep, which is so interesting. Yep, um, it immediately made me think of. Um, so long and thanks for all the fish, the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, yeah. and how, how humanity and earth is just a giant computer to answer a question or to make a question as right. it were. Answer what the me- life meaning of life universe and everything is. Yeah. So we need you as a human to slot into the machine in the great work to answer a, a timeless yeah. question. And you need to learn these things in order to fit into that in order. And so the assessment has to be done to find out where you're going to best fit and if you don't pass this test then bad things are going to happen yeah yeah it was definitely like that um and you know this is like there's two things i wanted to to talk about first let's talk about the cute thing which is neil likes a girl yes i love how he keeps mentioning it like and he three looks times at her. like they yeah. they did such a good job of like showing how he's like looking at her and she's like two desks in front of him to the right and like or to the left and he keeps on looking at her, and I was like, oh, my God, this little boy has this crush on this little girl. It's so yeah. cute. Um, but he's he's also, like, very worried that his friend is going to fail this test because he knows he hasn't prepped for it at all. Yeah. Um, but Wim, like, when he's asked in class, like, what do you want to do? And Wim's like, I want to save people. Yeah. But that isn't allowed because they're safety droids. Yeah. And this very much like ties into something that Joseph Campbell talks about, which um, I've talked about on the podcast before, but I think is really important. So when you go along with what society and folk understanding of what is acceptable, so it's often very enforced by the culture itself. So you're going to go out there and go to school and get married and have kids and work your heart out and then retire. Like literally that's your pathway in front of you. Yeah. Joseph Campbell calls that going the right handed way. You're going along with what society and culture want you to do. Yeah. Even if it is detrimental to your own perspective of what is right for you. Whereas Joseph Campbell talks about how heroes they are there to spot when society has gone off the rails and is not actually in service of the people and um, something's missing. So they go the left-handed way to try and find the elixir, the secret to heal the society that they're from. And so how you know that you're a hero on your own journey is because you are seeking your own joy at in, in a complete difference from what society says is your joy. Society says you need to go and become a data analyst to help with the great work. And you're like, no, no, no. I want to help people. I want to save people. And they're like, no, 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 that's not right. Yeah. And Wim is like, got that urge. So we already can tell he is that person. Yeah. 
we're introduced to Fern and KB. Sort of, we saw them on their speeder, yeah. I think, on the bus, but we get a little bit more of them. Well, they're the one that ones that show him the way. Yes. Because they're adventure. the ones that show him the shortcut to get to school that he then eventually takes, takes right? Yes. So when they dash off down that shortcut and and show to him the way, we're also getting a glimpse into the leader that is Fern mm-hmm. and the skill that is K2. KB. That is KB. And we get them, we get to see the two of them interact with each other in a way that's skilled. And it almost feels like she's a year older than him. Yeah. But they're both taking their assessment. Yeah, they're in the same right? grade. They're in the yeah. same grade. Um, and in fact, she is the daughter of the undersecretary who was doing the lesson, who called out Wim for his uh, his mm-hmm. kind of outside the box thinking in the way in which he wants to take the left handed path. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and the lady who does the mom of Fern and is the one doing the presentation to the class is the voice of Friday from the Marvel movies. Yep. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. She's been Friday for all of the movies. That's wild. Yeah. Um. So they're heading out on their uh, back to their houses and Neil tells Wim to study because, you know, he's really worried he's not going to pass. Um, and they really, he really wants to be in the same class as him, but he also really wants to be in the same class as the girl he likes. Mm-hmm. Um, but we see this like juxtaposition of Neil going into his house and seeing his parents and getting hugs from his two Atolan family members and then we see Wim go home and arrive to an empty house. Yes. Um, we cut to KB and Fern, who are uh, souping up their bike, working on it, but they need a new power converter. And a boy named Bonji Falafa. Oh my god, I don't like him already. <laughs> Just by the arrives name. with two other kids on his bike. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and he's there to like taunt Fern and, but they're like, no, we're still going to be ready for our race. Um, but they need a power converter for the bike to make sure that it can actually go to the speed that they need it to. Yeah, and how far away is Toshi station? Right. <laughs> it was very, uh, classic. Um, Fern rushes home to meet her mom, who of course we find out is undersecretary Farah. Um, and this is where... Oh my gosh, this is this is another juxtaposition between the characters that we see uh, compared to Wim, right? Wim who's like not very good at his classes, not very good at his tests, a uh, single dad. Yep. It seems like we have a single mom in Farah. Um and she's like I'm just here to bring this back to you this patch which shows that Fern is the top of the class. Yep. And that there's all this pressure on Fern to stay at the top of the class, but she's more interested in exploring her own hobbies and her own interests, which is, you know, bike racing. Racing and being cool and sticking it to the droids. Exactly. Um, Wim goes home, is studying. Wendell shows up and he has been studying. And he asks for his dad to read him a story just like mom used to. Yeah. Which is one of his Jedi stories. Yep. This is often how child lore is passed to kids is through fairy tales and folklore and lessons or Aesop's fables. Um, and Wendell's like, no, kid, I got to work. Oh, my gosh. I'm too busy for you. And don't heart- you think you're, you've outgrown bedtime stories? Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. What's And I really like I think I immediately looked at you or said to you, like, I, this is a terrible father. I'm just so disappointed in this dad. Like, nonstop. I'm nonstop disappointed in this guy. <laughs> like, there's no way that you would say no to a bedtime story. Why now. would you ever say no? Like, if, you're, if your 22-year-old kid calls you from <laughs> university and says, Dad, could I have a bedtime story? Why would you? I would be, you know, running to the shelves to find the book to read to them. Wh- whatever they wanted, right? Like, who, who wouldn't want to do that? Why is that... Why would that be looked down upon by society? 
I feel like there's something going on here because he's like in this big review stage and like it seems very serious and he has to work late and stuff like that so there's something we're not understanding about it but it also could just be you know adults ignore children when their own needs seem to take over right yeah and in in normal standard tropes that happens Mm-hmm. But as we've seen with modern storytelling and modern stories, um, with Stranger Things especially, mm-hmm. the parent's story is just as important and just as relevant yeah. to what's going on with the kid's story. And in fact, they work in parallel with each other um, so that you can see um, the changes being wrought on both sides. And yeah. so we are not... And I totally thought this was going to be the case that the dad would just be gone and then we would see him come. We would see the child returned to him at the end and the dad Mm -hmm. is still there and he just missed him the whole time. That would be very 1980s storytelling where a lot of this is based in. Yes. But we know that part of, to your point, part of this sort of thing that is wrong with the, with the land. Yeah. Is what is wrong with the adults. Yeah. Right, including Wim's dad. Exactly. Yeah. Good old Mr. Wemble or Wemble. Wemble and Wim. Wemble's story is just as important because we get his we get his Wendell. scenes. Yeah. Wendell? Wendell. We get Wendell's story just as individualized mm-hmm. as we do with Wim's. In fact, we get him on his own hunting and talking to droids and being yeah. told he's not supposed to be there as the ship takes off, which I'm, I'm moving ahead on you here. But nonetheless, his story is just as important. And I know you commented on the fact that these are like 80s, like similar to 80s yeah. movies. There actually is a more specific term for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's called, they're called Amblin stories. Right. After Amblin Entertainment. Right. So, and that is because yeah. there are so many of these movies that Amblin Entertainment focused on in the 1980s. Would you like to to get yes. some of them? So I was thinking it was very E.T. and Goonies. Boom. Those are the top yeah. two. E.T. Goonies, right? Yeah. But then you've got Gremlins, Adventures in Babysitting, Back to the Future, Young Sherlock Holmes, An American Tale, Harry and the Hendersons, Batteries Not Included, Jurassic Park. Right. And Hook. Of course. All of which are Amblin Entertainment movies almost all of these and i would be and i'm i'm definitely throwing in even though they're not amblin entertainment movies treasure island and treasure planet because i think that they are just as important to the context of this story as those ones i just named and in fact they're already being referenced in the context of this show already we're also getting uh other influences like pirates of the caribbean is quite heavily influencing this which Disney, Disney, you know, free, yeah. free to steal from your own. But is it is it Pirates of the Caribbean or is it's it the, Hook? It's, it's the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Yeah. Specifically, the ride is being referenced twice. Really? Yeah. When? So um, I'll, I'll get to it later on. Sure. All right. But we're rolling back. We're <laughs> finished with school. Wim, Wim sleeps in. Yep. <laughs> and misses the bus. And I love this scene so much because it causes me anxiety to miss the bus. And you know oh your dad's God. not home and your your dad can't drive you to school because you missed the bus. Yep. <laughs> um, and so he decides to take his speeder through the shortcut and he lifts his speeder over the like logs or the fence or whatever. And it makes the sound of the bike when you would drop your bike, you had to lift up your bike and drop it. It makes that sound. And I was like, Oh my God, this is like, so (laughs) when you would just like throw your bike on the driveway as you headed into your friend's house. Right. And, And, but what's on the front of his bike? Is there tassels? No. On the front of his bike is the basket, the same basket from ET. Right. So his speeder bike is essentially Elliot's bike from yeah. E.T. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, so it leads him into the woods, which, of course, uh, this is a dark forest motif. He's about to enter into a transformational period. Uh, this is like when you go into a forest, 
you're basically being cocooned by sort of mystery and wonder and uh, you'll also be stripped of things that you thought you needed along the way or that are part of your identity. And so he actually loses his helmet, which also tells us as the audience that he is being stripped of his safety uh, in the adventure that he's about to go on. Yeah. I also love the fact that while everybody else is taking an assessment, he's basically undergoing his own own assessment exactly his own trial um he falls into like a ravine mini gorge and uh is stuck he can't even get out but no. through his effort of trying to claw out he unveils uh this metal plate that yep. he can see underneath the the dirt he is approached by safety droids who are like what are you doing you're delinquent you're not in school <laughs> How did they find him is what I really wanted to know. I mean, I, I understand the context and the, you know, the show needs to get to a certain point quickly. But like, where did these droids come from and how did they get there so fast? Well, and that's a restricted area. Right. Right. Which we find out later. And they seem to just patrol that area. I only feel, felt like it was a restricted area because something happened there later as opposed to it was a restricted area right now. But E either way, it's an area that is people do not go in, mm -mm. let alone um, little boys get lost in the trench there, too. Exactly. And he couldn't get himself out. Yeah. And even the droid's like, you got to get get out of there and get to school. He's like, OK, how? <laughs> like, it was great. Um, but he, we see him and he's sitting inside outside of the effectively the principal's office. Yes. Uh, where... Fern also shows up because she's in trouble with the droids. Yes, because of her innate ability to reprogram and discuss and change. And she just loves pissing droids off. But it also shows that she's exceptionally capable and skilled at communicating with them. Yeah. Which is really subtly... Like, it's subtly done because she reprograms the droid that to go to her side with her mom's little interrogation that was going to happen because she wasn't upstairs in her room studying. Yep. And then we get her comment about, uh, I, I keep pissing droids off. Yep. And that gives us just the two kernels that we need for her to effectively navigate their forthcoming problem. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, Wendell shows up at the school and is so disappointed in Wim. He had to miss his review. He was in the middle of it. And then he... What is so weird about this test is that because he missed it and he gets to retake it, he minuses 50 points. And therefore has to get every single one right in order to just pass. What? Yeah. Basically, unless he's perfect, we're, we're failing him anyway. Yeah. Like that's the best his dad could do for him. But what a terrible interaction that is. The dad asks a question. Before Wim can even answer the question, the dad notices the clothes that Wim is dressed in and how he's all covered in dirt. So immediately asks that question. And so Wim doesn't get to answer the first question, starts to answer the next question. And that's when the dad says, I don't even care about that. You have you've upset me. And this is what is this is what's all come of that because he didn't care about the questions in the first place. Man, it sucks. Yeah. It sucks being a kid. It does. It does a great job of showing you why Wim is acting as he is mm -hmm. and doing the things he's doing and giving us, the audience, an immediate interest and availability to empathize with him. We empathize with him. His dad is being mean and asking questions and not letting him answer. The teacher was being mean because the droid that was doing the lesson was so boring. Not even the audience could listen to the droid that was talking. Yep. So all these things that are happening to Wim with the people around him pushing on him, we feel that much more disposed to appreciate and like Wim. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> But how do we feel about the relationship between Fern and Wim? Because Fern is constantly put in this position of being the best, doing everything, being awesome, uh, boys, girls rule, boys drool sort of scenario. Yeah. And then we slam all four of these kids together. Yeah, it's great. And, and it's mentioned because 
he offhandedly mentions, like, I found a Jedi temple. And Fern's like, hmm. Like, hmm. Maybe I'll go there. Yeah. <laughs> I like adventure. Yeah. You found something. There's probably going to be power converters in there. And I'm going to take a couple because I need one for this race. Exactly. This race is really important to me. But Wim and Neil decide to try and go after it as well. Yeah. Um, Wim, being this only kid. He is so well named because he, the root of whimsy is whim. And yeah. he is the epitome of whimsy. His Whatever his current mood or idea takes him, <laughs> off he goes to do the thing. If there is a blinking green button, he will press the it. whimsical fellow will be the one to push it. Yeah. And Neil is like, yeah, okay, we'll go on as long as we won't get in trouble and we won't, we'll be back in time for dinner or whatever. Yeah. So not like, only is it a normal sounding name, Neil, but also it's like the supplicant, right? Like he yeah. will always defer to Whimsy's needs. To yeah. Whim's needs, Neil will always defer to him. And I loved how they pull out their like walkie talkie basically and it's like, oh my God. Jedi One, you need a code name. And he's like, oh, I've got a perfect code name. Jedi 2. Yeah. Whoa, I need a code name as well. What will it be? Oh, I've got it. Jedi 2 reporting in. Yeah. And they show up at the uh, at the ravine gorge and they start to look at the sort of metal and then they hear this deep voice coming over. Yeah. And it's actually, they're being tricked by KB and by Fern. Which I'm really hoping we get to see... That, KB make use of that yes. again to their own betterment Benefit, and effect. Yeah. Because like, if you're going to show us this now, it's Chekhov's gun, right? It's got to it be, it has to be going to, it has to be something super cool later on. And we get the kids who are in this like kind of standoff on who gets to sort of own the cool thing that is behind this metal door and we get this cool introduction into the star wars universe of child lore of claimsies yeah i'm obsessed with this this is amazing <laughs> this is the star wars version of uh punch buggy yes yeah or uh it effectively like not it but in reverse too right but I love it because they and then they make they make up rules as they're talking about it. She did say claimsies like in time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then when she unclaimed it and KB then claimed it split second faster than Wim could claim it. Everybody was like, no, you're right. You you're got right. it. You, you got, got the, the claimsies. Thing. But yeah. it's OK, Neil, because I have a plan. We're going to open this door. And then we're going to Because we're so strong and we're so capable and we're so good and, and talented at opening things. And as soon as we step inside, <laughs> we'll claim the inside for ourselves because they only claim the outside. <laughs> I loved it so much. It was so good. Absolutely. So they start to dig out the door more and the girls are like, ha we tricked these guys into doing all this work. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't we smart? They both are like, haha, aren't we smart? I felt like KB was a little bit more on the side of the boys and yeah. empathized with them than Fern. And Fern's like, no, no, you let those boys be stupid over there, okay? Don't don't yeah. mess this. Don't mess up what the good thing we've got going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but KB ends up having to go over there and plug uh, her, like, headgear yeah. Which I think she's like a Lobot, effectively. Like Lobot from Empire Strikes Back. She's okay. effectively got like this computer associated with her brain. Uh, but like an actual physical cable like yeah. into it. That's so strange. And they never really looked at like Lobot. I didn't even know that was the character's name. I didn't really know they'd even looked at that tech since then. Like it seems to have been that one-off. And now we're seeing KB... In full evidence of it. It's great. I'm very interested to see if they're going to explore that or give us more as to why this is the case mm -hmm. and how this comes to be. Um, because it's very unique and different yeah. in, in Star Wars. Also, the visor does not seem to be necessar necessary to her Vision. because she's able, she is able to see yeah, I without think just, it. I think it's actually used almost like a... Um, like a HUD? Like a heads-up display? No, actually, I think it has a, a more psychological, emotional reason, because she uses it to hide, mm -hmm. right? So 
yes, there's probably something functional that it does, but whenever she's nervous, it the visor comes down. Yeah. Which is a cool character choice. A hundred percent. All of, all four of these kids are so interesting and fun and dynamic and engaging. And I'm, I just, I'm just so happy. There's another Ortolan on screen and we get, you know, a continuation of like the, the Max Rebo Ortolan, um, yeah. genealogy. And I just, he makes me happy. But we also got to see all the, we got to see the twins. Yeah. The, we got to see the whole family. We got to see the twins. Uh, uh, yes. We got to see the baby. Uh, were you su- super happy at the little kids? I was just like, it was a nice assortment because we watched Wim walk by on the sidewalk. They're th- behind glass. It's an, an entire mm-hmm. happy family, full family, complete family, mm-hmm. right? It's a full house literally with the twins. Um, although not a fuller house because the twins aren't in fuller house. Yes. Um, and so we get to see that, which <laughs> nice then cut. immediately, which immediately then takes us to Wim's situation with just him and his dad. Yeah, and exactly. how lonely he feels um, and apart. Um, so they go into the ship. And of course, this is crossing the threshold. Yes. They the are. The portal opens. The portal opens. They are going into yep. effectively the belly of the whale. They are going into the underground, the underworld. Yeah. And inside is spooky and there are skeletons. In fact, the first thing they spot is this droid that looks like a skeleton is missing one eye and is holding on to a lever, like a power switch, like a giant power switch. And, but before they, like, can we talk about the fact that it's this giant round portal in a hill? Yeah. And, and literally <laughs> yesterday we were at Hobbiton where, you know, literally you had you had Bilbo Baggins running out of the doorway yes. to descend down the hill at a, at a breakneck yeah. pace saying, I'm going on an adventure. And now we have the opposite of them going into yeah. the portal, into the hole in the hill, descending into the underworld, as it were, as they breach the portal between this world that they know and mm-hmm. they are safe and they are secure and their safety droids are there with them. And now they're going into a world of... You know, adventure and exactly. uncontrollable um, things to come. And, you know, it's it's very much just when you go from your known world to an unknown world, that's yeah. the experience of going into it. But the belly of the whale itself is like you go into your, you know, mythically in a lot of stories, you're swallowed by a beast. Yeah. But really, it's just the motif is that you are going into the earth. Uh, you are going into a, a place that you do not know, and there is death there. Yeah, that is the that is the key, right? And so, like when Pinocchio is swallowed by the whale on the ocean, or Jonah is swallowed by the whale, that's how, often how we see the the motif presented. Yeah. Um, but they're exploring the ship, and they accidentally close the door. Yep. Um, I would be interested in watching it again. Again, we've only seen this once, and mm-hmm. then we recorded it. We're recording on it after some brief note taking, and I mean the briefest of note taking. Yes. So we're recording on this very, very quickly. I'd be interested to note how, I, because I do believe I all four of these kids are in some way, shape, or form responsible for what happens happens. So KB gets them in. She powers the door to that lets them in. Uh, and of course, we get to the point where Wim pushes the button and everything undoes. But I really do think the other two kids have have done something on the ship that has caused it to then fully the, come to power the, and, and leave. The button is what causes the ship to leave. Yes, but the door closes because of the the lever. The lever. Yes. Um, and then they follow the red cable to try and turn on the power to open it up. Yeah. Um, but Wim goes off on his own because he is drawn by his own sort of path that he's on. Right. He's yeah. always saying like, "Oh, I'm just going to go off on." This is a Jedi temple. It means we have to go up, not down. Yeah. 
right? Like he's always like, I've got this other idea of where I need to go. Yeah, and he, also he's currently in opposition to Fern, mm-hmm. which is what's creating that great interpersonal struggle that's going on on screen for us. We don't need to see all four of them working well and enjoying each other's company just yet. It's great when there's some tension and some conflict. And so having Fern be the rightful, easy to spot leader, but Wim not recognizing that and wanting to be the leader himself. When I'm hanging out with my friend Neil, I'm always the leader. Now you're here. I'm still the leader, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And the fact that you just made that a question means you're not the leader, Wim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I love that, like, he himself is, like, following his own journey, but she is, like, I'm on my own journey, too, you doofus. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they both kind of have their Samwise Gamgee with them. Yes, no. yeah. And that is interesting, too, because I think that these four are really integral to the entire story that is to come, and their interpersonal relationships will all build as time goes by. But KB is the least connected to them, to all three of them. So far, yeah. So far, as, as from screen time, from a screen time perspective, we just had the least of KB because we haven't seen her in exclusion. So I am interested in seeing more KB as the story unfolds mm-hmm. and also to see how that develops the relationship that she'll have with those three other characters. Exactly. And we have Wim push the button because he's in, it's like, don't push anything. Don't touch anything. What if I just do the button? Yeah. <laughs> it was great. And that, of course, causes the ship to shake and to... Free itself. Free itself. But the power has been turned on so they can actually open the door. And we get this great scene of them almost falling out of the portal. Yes. As the ship is turning and escaping from their soil that has been in, but it's carrying them off on this adventure. Yeah. And we see Wendell coming up and seeing Wim like... You're leaving. Ah, no, come back. Hang on. Give justification to that happening. And so it's, it's, so what's really interesting there, it does, does that scene does two things. The first thing it does is it gives us Wemble's, Wendell's own connection to the story. So it gives him justification for what he does going forward in the same way that Winona Ryder's character bears witness to the strange things that are happening in, in, in the world, mm-hmm. in stranger things. So we know that she's right when she goes to pursue, you know, the truth against the authority. And that we will get with the dad. But it also does a secondary thing of Fern saving Wim. Yes. It's literally Fern that pulls him back in and saves him from what would be certain death from that fall as the ship is righting itself and turning over and that piece of root exposes itself. It's Fern that holds on and pulls Wim into the into the ship. Fern saves him. And I think it's that moment there that tells us Fern's the leader. Fern yeah. is the one that's going to save you at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. And so they end up on the ship in the cockpit, looking out into the stars and they see, they see the barrier and we see the kind of like red lights that are part of the barrier ever so briefly. Which we saw at the very beginning as well. Looking up, uh, but they pass through this barrier, which of course is like, you know, the ultimate threshold to this like adventure that they're going on. And out there is this world that they have never seen any idea of, which is the universe and the stars. And the truth. And the truth. Yeah. That right. Like they are stars exist. The truth is finally revealed to them. Exactly. And the ship enters into hyperspace on its own. <laughs> I love I love how their reaction to entering hyperspace is kind of like all of our reaction yeah. to entering hi- the, the, the hyperspace happening. And also really took me back to that moment that happened to us in July when we got to do Smuggler's Run. Yeah. And the first time I'm on the ship on the Millennium Falcon and we're about to blast forward and we go into hyperspace. I felt that. I was like, ah! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Myself. Like, I really did feel these kids' emotions when it happened. And that was the first episode, which I, it was perfect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It was a perfect way to show the intro to the world and, and sort of bring us into this fish out of water story 
where we very much identify with the characters that are like us as kids. Yeah. I, it was great. On to episode two, way, way out past the barrier. Yep. Um, they have awoken the droid on the ship. Yep. It's very lost and or lost in space mm-hmm. sort of motifs there too. Um, and they come about with this, especially the interactions on the ship with the droid SM-33, or as you immediately said when we saw the Sweet. subtitles. Yes. Yes. Which, I mean, of course, is a hook reference. Uh, who is played by Nick Frost. Yes. Who you may or may not know from such movies as... as Simon Pegg's, Pegg's Eternal Sidekick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he's been in so many Simon Pegg movies. Uh, and he wants to space them right away because the captain wouldn't want them in, you know, the cockpit. Yeah, or in the ship at all. Yeah. yeah. But Fern manages to convince the droid that... Uh, Fern had killed the previous captain and thus is the new captain. Which was perfect because I think they set that us set it up perfectly for us to to be there the moment when Fern yeah. says it, that we all were thinking that and then Fern says it. So it was great writing and great foreshadowing and also sets up a really fun, interesting, hard nosed pirate first mate droid as their prime benefactor and defender. Exactly. Which is, which yeah. is great. And it's it's nice to see the the character uh right away like instantly like switch to help them. And so this classifies as in a Joseph Campbell sense of the world word um supernatural aid. Mm. Right? Right away. Yeah. Because he is something that they cannot be. He's highly capable. He knows yep. how to run the ship. And also he's willing to defend them with all of his strength. Yeah. He's also an old guide as well. Yeah. Mentor as well, because he has all this secret knowledge. So they try to explain that they're from at Atten, uh, but it's not in his memory banks as a place that he's ever been. Yeah. And so they make the decision to go to the pirate port, um, uh, like the spaceport, but they don't know it's a pirate port. It's just right. a spaceport for repairs. Yep. Um, we don't know how old the ship is. No, we don't. I don't even know what make of ship it is either. Usually I can tell, um, but I don't even know where this ship came yeah. from. Or I don't even know what it looks like the right way up. Even because mm-hmm. the angles that we got of the ship are dark and less confined. But again, the ship is more about getting us from one place to the other. It's not about having a character of its own in this show, I think. At least not yet. Not until it's repaired and fixed and yeah. all the dust is blown. What was great is that every time that ship moved forward in any way, shape, or form, all this dirt and dust would yeah. like puff off of it the same way as it would puff up off the bed when one of the kids flops onto yeah. it. So you can tell this ship is old, dusty, and has been there a very, very long time. And Neil and Wim go and explore the captain's quarters, which is where that happened, where he jumps on the bed. He's like, we can all sleep in here. Yeah. This is so cute. And then they are like playing around with like the old things in the captain's quarters. And there's like an old hat that Wim puts on his head. And he's playing with like a spyglass. But like, again, we don't know how old the ship is. It looks... Like it could be a captain's um, cabin out of like Pirates of the Caribbean or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Well, we're Pirates of the Caribbean. All of those dead men, all of their flesh have dried and desiccated mm-hmm. and fallen to nothing but ash and dust. So they are but not but bones in this. And that is how old and how long that ship has been there. That ship has been there so long that earth grew over it and life grew up grew upon it mm-hmm. and and we're 
to, to like it makes me kind of question more even more about at atten like how does this come to exist where does why is this ship here and how old is this ship that they didn't even know it was there and it's covered in dirt and life and earth and trees yeah like centuries maybe centuries old and then i'm reminded of yet another steven spielberg movie um Based on the a, a book uh, where there is a great rich, a great largesse that is hidden away on a planet that no one knows where to find. And it's in a tomb and it's in a, a, a dungeon, a vault, as it were, uh, hidden away. And the person who uncovers this and opens that door will gain the richness of all. And that's uh, Ready Player One. And right. so now I'm also t- tying like that great company that was trying to build everything together, the multinational corporation that, you know, because corporations are evil and capitalist is bad and whatnot. Um, from a from a, a, a literary standpoint, that is subjected to Ready Player One, and then I'm like, wait, can we connect that to the people striving for the great work? And now you have to take your assessment. So, <laughs> are the people undergoing or undertaking the great work trying to also uncover this treasure that may exist oh, on At- Atten? Anyway, that's where my brain went as soon as. Uh, all this dust started puffing off everything <laughs> and wondering, how old is everything? How old is everything? And I also had an idea that maybe the ship itself has the treasure. Uh, and it's like an old pirate legend that that's where the ship was lost. <laughs> you know, like, or or that there's a buried treasure that this ship, like, cat, like this crew, like, buried on this planet. Like, right. That would be very very pirates piratey. of the Caribbean. Or just piratey in yeah. general, right? Like, that and too. there's a treasure map, and the ship has the treasure map. It and- did seem like SM-33, their task of that ship was to find a treasure. Right. A great treasure. We will hopefully get more as things go by. But nonetheless, the exactly. kids make the decision under... A great deal of duress. Yeah, to go to the port. To go to the port. Yeah, and he's, he warns them. He's like, uh, you may find a soft bed or a shallow grave, but you'll sleep well tonight. Yep. Whoa, that was great. Yeah. I loved it. I love the piratey stuff. It's it's making me so happy. I love pirate movies. and Absolutely. This is great. Um, so they arrive and... Uh, SM-33 offers to repair the ship, and a little fairy guy comes to attach... Little ferryman. Little ferryman um, comes to a, comes to a, uh, approach the, um, the, the ship, and uh, they jump aboard the little, like, ferry. It takes them to the port, and, he, and they're like, pay the guy. He pulls out his, like... Lunch money. Lunch money. Yeah. And gives him, like... A dollar or yep. whatever it is, a credit. Yep. And the little guy's like, oh my god! And he immediately goes and runs off. <laughs> Basically excited. pays him in a Mickey Mantle rookie card from Blast from the Past. Exactly, yeah. He's like, here's here's $100,000. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> here's your Bitcoin. Yeah, here's your Bitcoin. Tipping in Bitcoin. <laughs> um, yeah, and I immediately thought, okay, so these credits are worth a lot. For novelty's sake, let alone for value. Or something, yeah. Um, They end up exploring the port, and they get separated, and the boys kind of go off on their own, and the girls... uh, Fern is is almost segmented, and she sort of runs and sees, like, a brothel. Yeah. And, uh, like, catches eyes with one of the ladies in the brothel. The lady's like, oh my god, there are children here? Yeah. (laughs) And we find out her name is um, Melna. Yep. And uh, so she kind of goes after KB and Fern, who find each other eventually. And the boys are ordering some food. Of course. Like, what do you do when you're at a pirate spaceport? And you've got lunch money. you got lunch money. And so they're like, yeah, we'll have what he's having. And it's like this weird noodle dish with freshly... Uh, squeezed. Squeezed innards. Yeah, lobster innards. <laughs> Something. Yeah, I, I could not watch that. When he cracked the carapace open and poured it inside, I was done with that scene <laughs> immediately upon that moment. Um, I love what happens later with the food because it just it was so well done and funny. Um, but I do want to talk more about the relationship between Fern 
and the lady and how Fern immediately disbelieves any good intent on mm-hmm. the part of the woman. Yeah. It, it felt like it was coming from a place of like, girl, don't get stuck here or you'll become me. Yeah. Which was fascinating. And I, I want to know more about that a little but bit. But then Fern's response to that immediately is, you're you're not here to help us. You're lying to us. Right, yeah. Right? Like, I, I'm not even going to believe anything you say. You can't help us because I can't trust you. Exactly. Which is weird to know where that's coming from on the part of Fern. Like, where is that coming from? I'm not sure. I mean, she's got a weird relationship with her mother, so I don't know. I, I fully agree there. Uh, while all of this is happening... Can we just flash to a cutscene I have in my head? Okay. Because SM33 is like, I will conduct repairs. Wait, the captain is now on a, in a spaceport, and the captain seems to be very new to being a captain, and is surrounded by three other protectorate bodyguards who are small, weak, flabby creatures. You know what I'm going to do? I think I better go check on the captain. <laughs> I have some questions as well about the repairs and the order of primacy on this. So I'm just going to go. And then he doesn't take a ferryman. No, he just He literally opens the airlock and leaps over the gap to yeah. the ship itself and then wades into fight. Yes. Um, and... I wish we had seen even just a little bit of that, because while, yes, during the fight, we get to see how amazing SM-33 is, we also did get to see a lot of his justifications for what he's doing. We only got a couple of rudimentary logical precepts for it. Right. Before suddenly he's in there and then he's dispatched. So I I was like, is this all we're going to get? He's going to come back. Like, I feel like he's he's like, it's Nick Frost and like. You know, I I just hope he we're gonna come. He's gonna come back. Yeah, I can only hope. But we have like um, Brutus and the other pirates from the intro, right? Prologue scene show up. They capture the kids, even though, of course, he was a uh, sub thirty three was defending them quite well. The one that gets shot. It was interesting too because we got to see. All of the highlight ones that we saw in that mm-hmm. opening montage. The, uh, the the guy we've seen from The Mandalorian. The wolf guy who did, who kicked off the mutiny who is now in charge of yeah. everything. The guy who had one of his three eyes shot yeah. out and has now got a, a droid or an, um, a robotic eye in its place. All of these characters that had key moments mm-hmm. are now here on this pirate Port. Exactly. Yep. And uh, they're captured and sent to the brig. Yep. And with the sort of, you know, falling apart of SM-33, we have his little rat friend yep. who goes with Neil. Um, and then we get the, there was sort of a, a Pirates of the Caribbean moment when they were exploring the a cabin before but this we get the direct pirates of the caribbean moment where they're like go get the key um and this is like the dog that they're trying to convince to go get the key yep from the pirates of the caribbean ride which eventually shows up into the movie um um in that they're unsuccessful but we do get the introduction of jude law's character officially face and everything who he seems to be doing something with the force to get the key. Absolutely. Not just seems to, but we get key motifs in music. Yeah, we get the use that, of the force theme, which hasn't lied to us ever. No, and if they're lying to us now, why would they do that in this particular show with this particular vein, right? Like, why you you are not lied to in this sort of way, no. like you would like Goonies or any of the other sort of kid focused and oriented shows. You wouldn't do that. So, oh, one thing we didn't talk about was the reveal that At Atten has this treasure. We did briefly talk about it, but yeah. how the pirates like are in disbelief that these kids could possibly, possibly be, be from, from there. there. Yeah, with the with the old Republic credits that they have, yeah. lending authentic, 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 authenticity Authent- to their claim, and then being such a hot commodity desperately sought after um 
and then the conflict that inspires what the giant conflagration is. He throws his bowl of food into the cook's face and it catches fire and it sizzles the uh, ratty weasel guy. <laughs> oh, so cool. It, it was. Then even the fight scene with um, SM-33 and all the pirates before mm-hmm. he gets taken out with an electrical discharge. Now, I have a question. Is the little rat slash parrot in his eye... Is it gone or where did it go? Because it kind of fled. So I have thoughts. Yeah. I think the rat is the thing that controls the, the SM-33? droid. SM-33? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't discredit that, but also I, like the the rat couldn't have controlled the droid beforehand. I mean, it just, well, like, it's kind of like the parrot, right? Like yeah. the, the, the pirate's parrot. But I like the idea that they are a match set together yeah. somehow that they need to work together because the rat did crawl out and SM33 was still working, but exactly. It's just, I, I like the idea that they need to be together to work. I, I fully agree with that. I feel like the rat or whatever that alien rat type creature is, is kind of the animus to K- oh, SM33, yeah, 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 yeah. you know? Um, yeah. So your general thoughts. I loved them so this these two episodes I loved so much. I loved the energy of it. I loved how it ties into the classic sort of adventures journey that I always talk about. And there's very clear things happening from a story perspective, but I love how fresh it still feels and how joyful it feels too. That's wonderful. And people who have been listening to this since the start knew that I had promised that I would talk about something Okay. at the end of this. So the downfall of the empire. Yes. The reason I think There is so much trouble from Disney and Lucasfilm and all of the people, the creatives who are working on it in writing what happens next in the rise of the new order, the new republic, is that there isn't really a lot of historical precedent Mm -hmm. upon which to build this. Usually, these sorts of evil empires fall under their own weight of corruption right not due to the her heroic valiant set of outsiders saving the day right a la conan a la luke skywalker and his group and what you get as a result is a breaking of many into many 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 warring tribes and and whatnot mm-hmm. and there is no uni universal unified force that for good that occurs, right. especially because they don't have the systems and structure in place. And so we are left with this blessed hope at the end of um, Return, of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi that all will be right with the world. But it won't because there are no systems in place for that. And so when evil wins, when fascism takes over... The only way fascism is disbanded is when the people recognize it entirely and it breaks from within. There's no small core group of people that go and save the day. No, or it breaks from without, i.e. somebody Somebody bigger comes along and punches them in the face. Yeah, and then takes over to basically rebuild. Exactly. It, It leads me with dark thoughts because... There are two big superpowers in the world right now, in the U.S. and Russia. China? And China, and, and I guess China always this sleeping dragon. Um, but with the two ones that are definitely looking for more global power and control um, with these two, you, you definitely see worrisome attributes coming from them. And yeah. who's the big dog that's going to slap them both or break them up for what they've done? I don't, I don't see it and I don't know it and it leaves me with a bit of despair. Anyway, not the best of topics for what the force, No, but I mean, it led it... me to worry within the context of this show because they've structured it with At Atten in its own little shell, in yes. its own little suburb biome. You don't have to worry about what's going on outside, out there. Your, your, your lawns are taken care of and your safety droids are making sure everything's okay. And the trams all run on time. They're never late. Mm-hmm. Even if you are. Yep. Just be ready for your assessment. Yeah. It, yeah. it leaves you with lots of 
sort of meta analytical thoughts about the world and what it's saying about the world. Yeah. And maybe sometimes it's hard to sink into an escapist thing like this and find enjoyment and delight in a half hour of televised, you know, escapism when bigger things loom on the outside Mm -hmm. and constantly are pressing in. Yeah. Anyway. I think it's... That's why I left this for the end. (laughs) But I also think it's important to talk about because, like, George Lucas always intended Star Wars to reflect very serious things that were going on in the world around him. Yeah. And art inevitably being made by people will have these things that are affecting us in our unconscious bubble up to the surface. Yeah. So I think it's valuable. And I think if we see more of these things that we react to, it means that it needs to be talked about. All right. Well, this is the start of that to- that conversation. It is. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yes. Thanks for joining us. Or was that to me? No, to no. the listeners. Oh, good. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, listeners. Yeah, yeah. Look at how centric I was there. Are you talking about thank you? I'm here. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll be here all eight episodes. <laughs> Thank you for joining me in Aww. this. Yes. Uh, and for uh, contributing all your thoughts. And we will be back next week for another episode. But in the meantime, where can people find you, Kyle, if they're looking for you and anything you do online? Yeah, come look for me on Blue Sky. That's probably the better place to go. Yeah, I have pretty much migrated all over to Blue Sky. So. If you're looking for me, I'm on Blue Sky. I'm also on Instagram, uh, Facebook. But uh, yeah, those are the best places to look. Yeah. All right. Take care, everyone. And we will see you next time. Cheers. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is Orchestral Music by Christy Carew for What the Force. You can support the show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash whattheforce. We would like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love What the Force. Sophie H., Scott, Derek C., Minky Moo, Sarah Joy, John, In Wild Space, How Rude, Anna Perez, Neil, Christian Luca, Carly Ann, Scott C., and Susan. Support the show by wearing the forest with our merch, like and subscribe on YouTube, or leave a five-star review on iTunes or any other pod app. It helps people find the show. You can connect with us on Twitter at WT Force Show, What the Force Podcast on Facebook. Our website is whattheforce.ca or the Discord. Links are in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers.